I came across this story a while ago and have no idea who to credit it to or where it actually came from other than the internet. So I apologize for not giving proper credit. And if you know who or where this story came from, please email me, bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. Roughly 100 miles south of the Canadian border, adjacent to Flathead National Forest, and sitting at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, are the remnants of what used to be a working ranch. Today, the ranch sits vacant, but only a few years ago, it was bustling with ranch life. The following is the true story of the events that preceded the evacuation of the ranch. The family that owns the ranch prefers to remain anonymous. However, for the purpose of this retelling, we will call the father of the family, Jeff. Jeff had grown up in Montana on his father's ranch and is by any measure a modern-day cowboy. He's a man of true grit, hard work, and honest pay. Things had been going well for the family ranch. His two sons had grown into young men, and his business was as busy as ever. It was early fall, and the uninvited chill of winter was already present. The winter before had been long and difficult. Anticipating an equally harsh sequel, Jeff had been spending the last few weeks preparing for a long, cold winter. He had just finished canning some vegetables for the cold months ahead and was sitting down in his rocking chair on the porch for his morning smoke when he saw his eldest son, James, running towards the house, screaming. James was a chip off the old block and not easily shaken. However, he did have one soft spot. One of the ranch dogs, an American pit bull terrier named Jinky, had been James' favorite animal on the ranch for nearly 10 years. He was different than the other working dogs. He was a charismatic little knucklehead that was better at catching a nap with its head on James' lap than rounding up any livestock. And that was the relationship the two had since the puppy was born. In 10 years, Jinky had never left sight of the ranch house. Never once. He was a good, loyal dog that didn't stray. However, on this particular morning, he did. What's the matter with you, boy? Jeff still called his 22-year-old son, boy. It's Jinky. I can't find him anywhere. He's gone, Dad. I think a lion got him. James was clearly distressed. Now, Jeff is an austere and tough character, but like his son James, he too has a soft spot, and that soft spot happens to be his two boys. Had anyone else come running to Jeff with this type of distress, he would have told them to quit crying and go find the dog, but this was James. Now, don't get all worked up. I'm sure that dog's just catching an early morning nap somewhere. Come on, boy. I'll help you find him. Jeff slowly stood up from his rocking chair with a heavy sigh and put his pipe atop the porch banister. The two then made their way off to the sheep pasture, where Jinky spent nearly all of his time. Jinky! Jinky boy, where are you? The only response came from the disheveled sheep that were clamoring and bumbling about in some sort of distress. Jeff calmed the sheep and was just about to head into the nearby barn to look for Jinky when he got the feeling something was wrong. He took inventory and counted his livestock. He was missing a large female ewe. A missing dog is one thing, but missing livestock and a missing dog is another thing altogether. Jeff was a rugged rancher who had dealt with mountain lions, bears, wolves, coyotes, or even the occasional wolverine. Their search and rescue had quickly turned into a hunt. However, the more they searched the area, the more confused they became. There weren't any signs of predators anywhere to be found. There was no blood and no tracks. It looked like Jinky and the sheep had just disappeared into thin air. Jeff and James went back to the house and recruited his youngest son, 19-year-old Merle, to help thoroughly search the ranch for any signs of predators. The three men mounted their horses and started the long and arduous task of searching the 500-plus acres of the ranch. They split up to cover more ground, with Merle searching the west, Jeff heading north, and James covering the area to the east. They all planned to reconvene for lunch and discuss any findings. When lunchtime arrived, the three sat at their large dining table while Jeff's wife readied lunch. Jeff and James were busy discussing some mountain lion prints that James had discovered at the most eastern part of the ranch, which was closest to where the sheep grazed, and was their most promising lead. While the two spoke, Merle seemed rather absent and despondent. James was still holding out hope that he would find his furry best friend alive and well before the end of the day. Well, Jinky is one tough dog, and I wouldn't be the least surprised to find him somewhere in those hills, already done treat up that lion. Hmm. 
I don't know how to tell you this, James, but I found Jinky. Merle had a look of complete sadness when he broke the news to his brother. Immediately, James' face changed, and he knew what Merle meant. He had found Jinky, but he didn't find Jinky alive. Jeff tried consoling James before turning his attention towards Merle. As sad as he was to hear that he had just lost a ranch dog, he was even more concerned with what animal had killed the dog. After all, Jeff was running a ranch, and predators eating his livestock were bad for business. So what was it, son? A bear? A lion? Don't tell me it was a wolf. I don't want to deal with a pack of wolves, Jeff asked Merle. I don't know, Pa. I ain't never seen nothing like it. You're going to have to come take a look for yourself. After lunch, the three men went back to the stables to get their horses. Jeff and Merle pleaded with James not to accompany them, but he insisted on being the one to bury his old friend. The three men mounted their horses and made their way east. When they arrived at the spot where Merle had found Jinky, Jeff was surprised to find nothing there. He got down off his horse and inspected the ground before asking Merle where the dog's body was. Without saying a word, Merle motioned his hand toward a large pine tree. Jeff looked up into the branches of the pine, and sitting roughly twenty feet up and in the crotch of large branches was Jinky's lifeless body. Jeff's first thought was that a mountain lion had cached the dog up into the tree for safekeeping. He had heard of such behavior from other ranchers, but had never personally witnessed it. To know for sure, they were going to need to get Jinky down from the tree. The closest branch was easily ten feet above ground. James was only able to reach the branch by standing on Merle's shoulders. Once James finally climbed up to Jinky, he tried to hold back his tears, but couldn't. Refusing to just drop Jinky's body from the branch, James hoisted his dead friend over his shoulder and made his way back down. He handed Jinky off to Merle and jumped from the bottom branch to the ground. When Merle placed Jinky on the ground, the three stared in bewilderment. This wasn't the first time they had lost an animal to the wild, but it was the first time the animal they lost had no signs of attack. There were no bite marks, no claw marks, and no blood in sight. However, the cause of death was very obvious. Jinky's neck had been snapped like a twig. Jeff had never known an animal to be capable of this type of kill. This was not the work of a cougar, a wolf, a bear, a coyote, or a wolverine. This seemed more like the work of a sick human being. At a loss for explanation, the three men went back to the ranch house and continued the many hard tasks of prepping the ranch for winter. A week passed and things seemed to be normal once again at the ranch. The temperature steadily decreased with every passing day and the first snow had fallen leaving a blanket of white on the ground. Jeff was once again sitting down for his morning smoke when Merle approached him. Papa, you gotta see this. We're missing another sheep. I don't know what to make of it. Jeff and Merle headed east towards the sheep. When they arrived, Jeff was beside himself. In the lingering fallen snow were deep tracks gigantic barefoot human tracks. Jeff didn't have anything to measure the tracks with, but estimated they were at least 16 inches long and 7 inches wide. The two men followed the tracks to the easternmost part of the property until they disappeared into a tree line where the snow accumulation was considerably less. Thinking that they were dealing with a large deranged human being living alone in the woods, Jeff decided to head back to the ranch house and grab James. He couldn't have a crazy barefoot vagabond stealing his livestock. The three men then followed a deer path into the forest to the east. They slowly made their way deeper into the forest, working their horses around deep brush and heavy foliage. It was slow going and the men had been searching the forest without a sign of any tracks anywhere. They were just about to head back to the ranch house when James called out to Jeff and Merle. Hey, I think I got something over here. James had found a trail of what seemed to be pure destruction. Several saplings had been splintered in a rather unusual way. They were twisted around to the point where they just exploded under the pressure. It almost seemed as though someone had twisted them by hand, but that was impossible. Nobody was strong enough to splinter a tree like that by hand. The thick brush was worn down and a clear path had been cut through, but not by machete. The path seemed to be bulldozed through, like whoever made it had simply walked right through the thick forest brush, sharp thistles and all. The three men followed the path in the brush for about 50 yards until it disappeared in a clearing. At the far end of the clearing was a huge white bark pine. 
As the men neared the pine, they noticed dark crimson streams of blood streaking across the pine's white bark. The men's eyes followed the path of blood high into the tree until they discovered the blood's source. High in the crotch of the large branch was their dead sheep. It had been cached for storage, just like Jinky. However, the sheep was partially eaten. Once again, James scaled high into the tree to retrieve the sheep. He pushed its body over the branch, and it fell 15 feet to the ground and landed with a loud thud. Like Jinky, the sheep's neck was broken. The flesh was torn raw near the neck, and blood dripped from the open gash. Upon further inspection, the men discovered two very distinct and rather unusual bite marks. They were horseshoe-shaped and resembled the bite mark of a human, with the exception that they were much larger. The men quickly grew concerned and had no idea what to make of the horrific scene. The day before, Jeff had shared his worries that the perpetrator was a large, deranged, homeless vagabond. At the time, his sons chuckled at the thought, but now they weren't so sure. Whatever had killed this animal had carried it away alive, broke its neck before eating any of it, and cached it in a tree for storage. There wasn't an animal in Montana that behaved in this way. The men loaded the sheep onto the back of Jeff's horse and started to make their way back to the ranch. While passing through the thick forest, the men came upon a stream and stopped for a moment to allow their horses to drink some water. While dismounting, Jeff thought he heard someone cough. He asked if anyone else heard it, but no one had. All of a sudden, Jeff's horse jerked back and reared up on its hind legs. It was clearly spooked. Soon the other horses followed suit, and the scene grew chaotic. The horses were bucking around. They could clearly sense something the three men couldn't. It was hard to calm the horses, but Jeff and his boys finally managed to regain control. Once they were manageable, the men noticed that each horse was staring at a dense thicket, maybe 20 yards away. Jeff peered deep into the thicket and thought he saw some movement deep in the brush. That was when it happened. A low, bass-filled, guttural groan started to vibrate through the woods. It slowly morphed into a high-pitched scream that sounded like bloody murder. The horses jerked back and James's horse broke free of the tree it was tethered to and fled from the woods. The men barely noticed the fleeing horse. All of their attention was on the dense thicket 20 yards in front of them where the scream had come from. It was then that the men had the scare of a lifetime. In the close distance, a creature slowly stood up and above the brush it was hiding in. The creature was absolutely massive. It stood at least seven and a half feet tall, was covered in hair, had a massive barrel chest with a human-like face. The men were frozen in place and unable to do anything but stare at the strange creature. The creature returned their stare while letting out frightening bass-filled growls, much like a cornered dog. Its breath formed thick clouds around its mouth in the cold Montana morning. Its arms were muscular yet lean. Its chest was half as wide as the creature was tall, and its hands were just like a human's, but hairier. It stomped on the ground, shaking the forest floor, and growled louder at the three men. Merle quickly pulled the rifle out from its scabbard hanging from his saddle, but before he could turn back around and aim the rifle, he heard the creature thundering through the brush and towards them. Jeff never took his eyes off the creature and swears that it covered the 20-yard gap between them in less than two seconds. It was lightning quick, even through extremely dense forest brush. Merle turned around just in time to see his father flying through the air and landing in the cold waters of the forest stream. The creature was just about to make its move on James when Merle pulled the trigger. Crack! The rifle echoed through the forest and left Merle's ears ringing. He hit his mark and buried a shot deep in the creature's back left shoulder. The creature howled in pain, gave Merle a deathly look, grabbed the large female ewe off the back of Jeff's steed, and with only a few strides, quickly disappeared deep into the forest. The men listened to the crashing sounds of the fleeing creature grow further and further until they could no longer hear it. Jeff was still laying in the cold waters of the stream, frozen in fear and unable to speak. His boys had never seen him in such a way. He was undoubtedly the most shaken up he had ever been. When his sons asked if he was all right, he didn't respond. His skin was pale white, his hands shook like a leaf in a windstorm. He was barely able to mount his horse. The three men made their way back to the ranch house. All the while, Jeff remained silent. It wasn't until they were nearly at the front porch of the ranch house when Jeff finally spoke. 
Don't say a word to your mother. Dad, that was a Bigfoot, James responded. Jeff knew what the creature was. He didn't believe in them, but he couldn't deny what he saw. For the first time in his adult life, Jeff found himself doubting his abilities to protect his family. He was a rational man, but what he encountered was not at all rational. He had been attacked by a Bigfoot, and the creature had thrown him a good ten feet like he was a paperweight. He knew he couldn't go to the authorities. They would undoubtedly think he was mad, and in a small community that had the potential to ruin his business. His family name was the ranch's brand, logo, and marketing manager. He couldn't have people thinking he was crazy. Whatever he was going to do about the creature, he had to keep the operation in-house. That night, Jeff, James, and Merle slept very little. The following morning, James asked Merle and Jeff if they had heard the screams in the forest. Neither of them had, but James swore that he heard the same blood-curdling screams coming out of the forest from 2 a.m. until the early morning. It was there and then that Jeff made up his mind. They needed to track down the wounded Bigfoot and finish things. The men set out first thing after breakfast and spent the day searching the woods. They covered a lot of ground but were unable to pick up the wounded Bigfoot's tracks. After several fruitless hours, the men decided to head home. On their ride home, they discovered that three more sheep had been killed while they were gone. Their necks had been snapped like the others. However, unlike Jinky and the large female ewe, these three sheep were left dead in the field. Jeff felt as though the creature wanted them to find the corpses, like it was taunting them. When the men arrived at home, they found a horrific scene. The door was bashed in and the house was turned upside down. Shattered mirrors scattered across the floor, cabinets had been smashed to splinters, and the large dining room table was broken to bits. Martha! Martha, where are you? Jeff could feel fear consume him. His wife Martha was his life. Jeff and his boys called out to Martha for several minutes. Eventually, they heard the sound of someone crying coming from the ceiling. She had climbed the attic stairs and closed the attic door behind her. When they found Martha, her eyes were red from crying and her hands were uncontrollably shaking. It took the better part of two hours for the men to get her to calm down and speak. The story she relayed left the three men speechless. While they were gone, Martha was out front feeding the chickens, when Roxy, another one of their working dogs, came running towards the house. Roxy was a courageous herding mutt that was much more brawn than brain. She had chased bears and mountain lions up trees. She wasn't afraid of anything. But when she ran up to Martha, she had her ears pinned far back in fear, and she cowered beneath Martha's legs, as though she was trying to hide from something. It was then that Martha heard the same scream that the men had heard the day before in the woods. She looked towards the sound and saw the silhouette of a very large man, about a hundred yards away, staring back at her. The dog ran from under Martha and hid deep under the front porch, whimpering. Sensing something dreadful was about to happen, Martha ran to the front door of the house. When she looked back toward the silhouette, she saw that it was not a man at all, and it was charging towards her. The creature managed to cover about 70 yards in the time that it took Martha to run the 15 yards from the front yard to the front door. Martha found herself staring at a massive Bigfoot in full sprint running towards her. Its face possessed a look that Martha described as one of pure evil intent. She ran inside the house and slammed the door and locked the padlock behind her. As soon as the door bolted shut, an enormous crash echoed through the house and the door hummed with the vibration of being hit extremely hard. The creature was trying to break through the door. Martha ran to the attic door, pulled the stairs down, climbed into the attic, closed the door, and hid. She listened while the creature broke through the front door. Over the twenty minutes that followed, she could hear the creature destroying her house. It was growling, breathing heavy, and grunting while it threw furniture from one end to another. By the time the men had returned to the house, the Bigfoot had long disappeared, and Roxy was nowhere to be found. It was the last straw for Jeff and his family. That day, they left the family ranch and stayed with friends. Over the next few months, Jeff returned to the ranch to care for the livestock. On his first visit back to the ranch, more livestock had disappeared, and he found the body of Roxy lying on the front porch. Jeff started selling his livestock off as quickly as possible even taking low-ball offers just to be done with the ranch. Today, Jeff is retired and still owns the vacant ranch. 
He was never able to bring himself to sell the property where he raised his boys. Take that picture and I will kill you. The Rocky Bounds Incident Rocky Bounds did see a Bigfoot run through his headlight beams as he peered into the inky blackness that was Highway 18 one night in the Oregon Coast Range. Rocky is a lifelong hunter and very much at home in the woods, but up to that point, he had never seen anything that gave him reason to think that Bigfoots really existed. But seeing that hulking form glide across the darkened highway left him with no other choice but to conclude that the Bigfoot legend was for real, and some huge, fast, and rarely seen creatures inhabit the forest. Since that brief but unforgettable sighting, Rocky began to understand why a friend of his who lives in an isolated homestead will not leave his house after dark without a loaded gun in his hand, even just to get into the car. But having a Bigfoot sighting on the highway was not going to keep Rocky from his favorite pastime, which was bow hunting for elk in the mountains near his hometown of Dallas, Oregon. Which is exactly what Rocky was doing one Saturday morning in the fall of 2001 when things began to get a little strange. If Rocky hadn't once seen a strange shape shambling across the road, he might not have made the connection between the unusual sights, sounds, and smells that he encountered on this particular excursion in his favorite patch of elk habitat. Rocky is an avid bow hunter, so in the fall, Rocky's wife understands that she won't see much of her husband on Saturday mornings. Rocky's favorite place to hunt lies on a tract of private timberland in Oregon's Coast Range. He parked his car at the gate that keeps the vehicle traffic off the private road. He began walking up the steep road towards a checkerboard of clear cuts and dense timber stands. He knew that the mix of timber stands provides ideal habitat for the elk herd he frequently stalks. It's not a pristine forest, but the roads provide easy access and the cleared areas provide more abundant grazing than is found in the dense stands of alders, hemlocks, firs, and cedars that dominate the wet, shady creek bottoms. Steep ravines and swampy bottomlands make traveling anywhere but on the logging roads very difficult. So Rocky walked the logging roads at dawn with bow in hand in search of the elk herd. Everything was ordinary until some bent and twisted alder saplings caught his eye something seemed strange. The saplings were twisted off at a height that was out of his reach. The leaves on the broken treetops were still green and alive. The trees were too stout to have been broken off without power equipment, and they were twisted, not just broken. There was no sign of chains or cable damage on the bark of the trees. No sign of anything. Just lots of two and three inch diameter alders broken and twisted off about eight feet off the ground. Then he found the strange clearing beneath a cedar tree. Something or someone had fashioned a bed out of ferns and fir boughs. It was a big bedding area and it had been recently used. Bear was the most likely suspect, but something seemed unusual. Rocks had been arranged in a circle to define the edges of the bed. The boughs had been hauled to the spot from somewhere else, but not being one to favor mysterious explanations, Rocky dismissed it as the work of a tired hunter or a very industrious bear. He continued his hunt. Now he was hearing strange noises in the thickets around him. It was late September and the alders that thrive in the creek bottoms still had all their leaves. Salmonberry, devil's club, elderberry, thimbleberry and ferns combined to make an impenetrable thicket. Visibility was very limited. Something could be quite close and yet still out of sight. From the sound of the stalking, it seemed to Rocky that whatever it was, it was very close. The roads Rocky traveled descended into a swampy bottomland. Now the once wide road had turned to a one-lane, two-track affair with sagging limbs of vine maple and elderberry forming a tunnel-like canopy that gave the road a claustrophobic feel. The situation had ambush written all over it. As he crept along the road, he heard a strange noise in the brush followed by the crash of a tree falling over. Rocky wheeled toward the noise and ducked down. He scanned the area where the tree had fallen. Nothing. Then a piercing scream echoed through the sun-dappled woods. Now he was really spooked. This was not fun anymore. He found another twisted off tree. Rocky looked at the ground at the base of the broken tree and saw a fresh footprint in duff. It measured 14 inches long and 7 inches wide. Next, he found a large, fresh pile of feces in the middle of the narrow spur road. The stench was overwhelming. 
At this point, Rocky is coming around to the realization that he may be in the vicinity of a Bigfoot. He decides it would be a good idea to collect some of the scat. He wrapped it in the cellophane from his sandwich and took it with him. He heard a new sound, the knocking of one stick on another, or perhaps a stick striking a tree, but with a resounding echo that hinted of impressive strength. Rocky stopped and listened again. More knocking. He took one of his arrows and tapped it against the side of his bow in response to the tapping from the woods. He heard more knocking. He responded with more tapping of his own. This went on for 20 minutes. Rocky felt sure that no one else was in the woods that morning, but that something was answering his taps with wood-on-wood knocks. Rocky displayed an admirable coolness and curiosity that few could muster under the circumstances, but he eventually had enough and headed back down the road toward his car. As he walked, he heard steps and sticks breaking just out of sight in the brushy forest. Something was following him out of the woods. He made it to his car without further incident and headed home. Later that day, Rocky logged a sighting report on the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization website. His array of Class B events was impressive. Lots of strange noises, unusually large tracks were found, a large and very smelly scat, and a few hairs found on a tree. All in all, quite an array of unusual events. When I saw the report, I gave him a call. He was eager to hand over the scat to someone and get it out of his home freezer. He also had the hair. We arranged to meet on a Sunday at the high school where Rocky is the building custodian. The next day, I sat with Rocky and my friend Keith Baker in a very nice and very empty school library in Wilsonville. I like to take a friend when meeting a witness. It gives me someone to discuss the situation with, and it provides a little company on the drive. Rocky recounted the entire experience for us. He handed over the scat and wanted to know what I thought of the events he experienced. Well, I explained, there's nothing that you mentioned that I haven't heard before. We see twisted off trees in other places where people have had sightings. Reports of strange knocking often occur, sometimes to be followed by a sighting. There's a host of such events that may be pretty good indicators of a Sasquatch presence. A feeling of being watched is probably the most common sensation reported by those who report possible encounters. Some of them have eyewitness sightings shortly thereafter, though Rocky did not. Being followed by something that kept out of sight and sounded like it was walking on two feet is another observation that is mentioned in many Bigfoot sighting reports. Not many people report the twisted tree thing. Very few are even observant enough to notice something like that. We call them twist-offs in the Bigfoot biz, and it is something we often encounter when Sasquatches are thought to inhabit a particular patch of woods. Hypotheses abound, but no one is quite sure what to make of it. Warnings, territorial markers, navigational aids, or idle destruction. Take your pick. Skeptics shrug it off as snow, wind, or vandals. Sometimes they are correct. Snow will generally fall a number of trees in a stand. Wind will lay them down in the same general direction. One stout tree, still wearing green leaves but bent and twisted from a point of eight feet off the ground, is suspicious, indeed. Whatever it is, it'll never sell the idea that Bigfoots roam the landscape, though the field guys see it a fair amount, and they see it as an indication of an active area. Rocky didn't want a namby-pamby answer, though. He wanted to know whether I think his experiences added up to a Sasquatch or not. After my usual disclaimers about how little any of us really know about the whole deal, I decide to stick my neck out. Yeah, I tell him. I would say that even though not one of your observations is a definite, you are reporting quite an array of things that all point in the same direction. I'd say you probably did bump into a Sasquatch. What about the turd? Rocky wants to know. Can't they take that and analyze it for DNA or something? Yes and no. The fact that you found one that is so fresh that it was still steaming is about the best you can do. I'll give you that. DNA workups cost about $800, and there aren't many guys who want to spend that kind of money on a scat, since there's every chance that the DNA that is isolated is coming from the prey that was consumed by the animal, no matter what that may be. The BFRO can't afford a panel van full of emergency response gear, and they can't afford an $800 DNA workup on a scat. The fact that the scat is fresh means that it is possible to find the epithelial cells that are shed from the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. 
Those could yield some excellent DNA if the right part of the turd is analyzed. But that's a crapshoot. Sorry for the scatological pun. Anyway, I know a guy at Portland State who might try to work it with a batch of other samples. They have the primate DNA markers that could be used to determine whether it's of primate origin. But in the end, the result is always the same. They can tell you only what animals the scat isn't from. They can't tell you it isn't from a Sasquatch because no one has the known Sasquatch DNA to match it with. If it is Sasquatch DNA that is isolated, it will not match anything else in the few sections of the chromosomes that are carefully examined. What does that tell you, really? Unfortunately, not very much. Bottom line, don't look for the Sasquatch mystery to be solved by DNA. Before that can happen, someone has to take a chunk of tissue from a dead Sasquatch specimen. Only then will the DNA from that Sasquatch be useful for identifying other specimens. Even then, it is possible that, due to variation within the species, other samples would not make a perfect match. Kind of a catch-22, eh? Rocky shifted restlessly in his chair. He looked both bored and confused. Clearly, he was hoping for a simpler, more optimistic answer. Time to change the subject. Let's try something, I suggested. Don't hold your breath on extracting DNA from the turd, but I'll see what I can do. Meanwhile, we need to try to get these guys to step out into the open a bit more if they're willing to play along. Now, if I go with you and we go wander around the site, I can tell you what's going to happen. Nothing. As much as I would like to have you lead me to a Sasquatch that I can see for myself, I know that it would be a waste of time to try. Have you ever seen a Sasquatch? Rocky asked, as does every other witness I interview. Nope, but the Bible says, Blessed are those who have not seen, but who believe. Maybe that makes me blessed, though I don't think the Bible was talking about Bigfoots. Anyway, that's not what this is all about. Besides, I know better. Even if they are there, you wouldn't be able to just take me up there and show me one. It doesn't work that way, and believe me, I've tried. I've learned that there's a smarter approach. You had the encounter before. Maybe there's something about you that the locals are comfortable with. Maybe it's because you are a local too. I don't know. I do know that if anything else is going to happen, you have to go back to the area yourself, alone. Just like you do when you're hunting. Heck, take your bow and do some hunting, but I would suggest that you take some bait with you. Think of it as a peace offering to the locals. We had great success with fruit last year at our Skookum Meadow expedition. We think they like fruit. If they live in the wilderness, they may see it as an uncommon treat. Apples are about the cheapest, easiest to handle, and keep better than most other fruits. Don't be skimpy either. They may not move on two apples, but they may go after a big pile of them. The pattern I think we're seeing is that they'll take part of what's left out and leave the rest. It seems they are wise to obvious baiting, so don't get cute and put the apples in the middle of a patch of bare, fluffy earth. They know what you're trying to do. If you're going for tracks, try to be less obvious about your intention. On the Skookum deal, we left a pile of fruit in a mud puddle. We were lucky because the puddle was disappearing fast as the weather warmed up, leaving a patch of mud that was perfect for impressions. But don't expect big old footprints that go straight to the bait. It seems they're more wary than that. You can expect them to get low and crawl in. So you're just as likely to find the impression of a leg, an ass, a knee, or whatever. Anything but footprints. It's not that they never leave footprints. It's more like they don't leave footprints when they can help it. And they're probably even more wary when they know people are around. By the way, do you have a camcorder, Rocky? Nope, I don't even have a camera, he confessed. I can get one of those disposable ones, though, that comes with the film when you buy it. That's what I use to take these photos of the twisted-off trees and the footprint. Well then, it'll have to do. You'll have to get pretty close to any kind of usable photo with one of those. No harm in trying, though. It's my guess that you have almost no chance of sneaking up on one of these guys. You're on their turf out there, and they seem to know you're coming before you get there. From what I've investigated, the hunters who've gotten the best look at a Bigfoot were in tree stands. Do you ever hunt from a tree stand? No, I never use one. I like to keep moving. If I do see a Bigfoot, what should I do? Are they dangerous? Not unless you try to shoot it, I offer. If you do see one, the first thing I would do is sit down. You look a lot less threatening that way. Staring directly at an animal may be a potential challenge or threat, so if you do see one, even at a distance, try not to stare directly at it. 
but don't let it out of your sight either. If you take your eyes off it, even for a second, that's the last you'll see of it. They'll be gone in a blink of an eye. I can't explain it, but I've heard it happen too many times to doubt it. Somebody gets an eye on one of these bad boys, and the next thing you know, they hear something else stir behind them, or off to one side. Then they turn their head to see what the other noise is all about. Nothing there. So they turn back to the one they were looking at, but poof, it's gone. Go figure. It's my guess that they work in pairs. Whenever you see one, there is likely another one around. Maybe more than one. When one of them is feeling just a little bit cornered, another one goes off in a big way. You're already a bit spooked, and you can't help but look toward another noise. This gives the first one the opportunity it needs to make a clean getaway. They work together very effectively. Anyway, you should be so lucky as to get a good look at one. But you won't do it by sneaking around. Unless you make yourself invisible, they'll know you're in their woods. We talked for an hour. I remember how intently he listened to everything I said. He never became restless. His eyes never wavered. They stayed locked on mine as we talked. He seemed to be soaking up every word. Rocky resolved to return to the area as soon as he could, which wouldn't be until Saturday. He had his other experiences at dawn, so he agreed that dawn would be the best for the return trip. Can I take my bow and hunt elk while I'm there? Rocky wondered. Don't see why not. You had your bow last time when all the other stuff happened. Since the chances are you'll go back and see a whole bunch of nothing, you may as well do some hunting. Rocky gave me the scat and the hair he collected. We shook hands and parted ways. On our way home, Keith and I evaluated his observations, his demeanor, and his overall credibility. The general feeling was that he was probably on the level. He was willing to meet us face to face and tell me the whole story. Hoaxers do not want to sit down for a serious interview, and if they did, they would not keep a straight face for very long. Hoaxers who send bogus reports on the internet are usually teenagers, but whoever they are, they have no desire to look a serious researcher in the eye. But no hoaxer is going to show up for a meeting with photos of curious items, hair samples, and a frozen scat in a cooler. This guy has a good job, and he had keys to the entire school. Rocky was sincere when recollecting his experiences, and he was interested in everything I had to say. He was eager to hear suggestions as to what he might try next. Still, he never actually saw anything, though he did have the sighting a few years before. On this outing, he just heard a bunch of strange noises, found some indistinct footprints that were a bit small by Sasquatch standards, found a bunch of twisted trees, and of course the scat that truly stunk to high heaven. He was definitely a hunter, there was no doubt about that. He knew the lingo, he knew when the bow season began and ended, and he had a hunting license, no doubt there. I asked enough questions about his hunting technique to feel sure that he knew his stuff. All in all, I concluded that it was a legitimate Class B. I wrote up an evaluation of the interview while it was still fresh in my mind, but I wasn't going to post anything on the internet until he was through with the follow-up visits to the site. Most sightings end pretty much right where things were at that point. Despite the good intentions and keen desire by the witnesses to resolve their strange experiences, it is just not expected that they will be too eager to return to the site unless they live there. If they do return to a place where a sighting happened a week ago, the creature could be expected to be many miles away by then. I've been to the location of many recent sightings in a timely manner, and I've always been skunked. Maybe a track is found, but that's about it. If the witness is willing to go back to the site alone, that fact can be seen as one of the best indicators that they sincerely believe that whatever they experienced is for real. But I really didn't expect to hear any more from old Rocky, and if I did, there wouldn't be any real news. The last thing I expected was the kind of call I got from Rocky on the following Saturday afternoon. Tom, that was my favorite hunting spot, but I'm never going back there again as long as I live, were the first words out of Rocky's mouth. Now there's a line I've heard a few times before, always by a hunter who had just had the daylight scared out of him. Sergeant Chris Berg, of Divide Ridge fame comes to mind. I knew whatever was coming next was going to be good, but I never could have guessed how good. There's at least four of them. I saw two with my own eyes, and I definitely heard two more. It was just like you said. They tried to distract me when I tried to approach the first one I saw, 
That's when the big one stepped out. It was all I could do to keep from wetting my pants. I've never been so scared in my entire life. My wife said I looked like I saw a ghost when I got home, and she's not far off. I'm still shaking. Okay, okay, start from the beginning, I coaxed. I got there before dawn, just like before. I had my bow with me and a disposable camera. I also brought a bunch of apples, just like you told me. I left them in a pile in an open area beneath some power lines. Then I just kept hunting. After about a half hour, I had walked in a big circle and was back to where I could see the fruit again, still lying in a pile on the ground. I was about 200 yards from the bait, and I couldn't believe what I saw. There, on the ground, doing a belly crawl toward the fruit, was some sort of brown, furry object that wasn't there before. It kind of looked like a bear at first, but it was doing a belly crawl right toward the fruit. I couldn't believe it. I got out my camera, but I could see that I was too far away to get a decent photo. It would have been a brown blob on the ground from far away. So with my camera in one hand and my bow in the other hand, I started to creep closer to the thing on the ground. Now I could definitely see it moving, and it was definitely doing a belly crawl toward the fruit. Then it happened. I hear this loud screaming going on behind me, but I remember what you said. What did I say? You said they tried to get you to turn around to look away, he replied. So did you? Hell no. I did what you said. I didn't take my eyes off that guy on the ground. Because I remembered that you said that they would try to distract me. Now this thing behind me was making quite a racket. For all I knew, it was doing jumping jacks back there, but I didn't turn around. I remember you told me not to. Great job, Rocky. Then what? So I'm getting closer to this thing doing the belly crawl but still too far away for a good picture. All of a sudden, I hear something else start screaming and howling behind me, but this one was behind me on my other side. It was definitely a second one. It was behind me, but off to my right. The other one was behind me on my left, and it was still screaming too. So now I have two of these things screaming their heads off behind me. It was all I could do to not turn around. If you hadn't said not to turn around, I would have for sure but I just kept my eyes on the one ahead of me on the ground. It was still too far away to get a picture, so I kept moving toward it. Meanwhile, these two things behind me are still going nuts, you know, screaming and hollering. Heck, for all I know, they were doing jumping jacks back there, but I wasn't going to turn around. No way, because you said that's what they wanted me to do. I didn't take my eyes off that one on the ground, but then he stepped out of the bushes. He? Yeah, he, and he was huge. Must have been eight feet tall, easy, maybe nine. He was huge, he was mad, and he was close. Thirty feet away, maybe less. No way I couldn't look at this one. He was screaming and waving his arms. How'd you know it was a he, I asked. Because I could see that he was a he. There was no mistaking it. He had a penis, and it wasn't small. I mean, to tell you, it was obvious. Then what? So as soon as I look at this big guy off to my side... I flash on the fact that I just took my eyes off the first one, so I glance over to see if he's still there. It was, but sure enough, it was now on its feet and heading for the tree line. That's when I could see it wasn't nearly as big as the one beside me. I could see that it was no bigger than I was. It might have been a little smaller than I am. Sounds like that could have been a juvenile, I offer. Well, whatever it was, it's on its feet and it's heading for the trees. I'm still standing there with my bow in one hand and my camera in the other. I look back at the big male, and I'm about to wet my pants. But then I also think I should try to get a picture of this one. It was lots closer and lots bigger than the one that was getting away. So, I start to raise the camera to my eye, and as soon as I did, I get this message. It wasn't spoken, but it was loud and clear. It said, If you take that picture, I will kill you. So what'd you do? I lowered the camera, man. Smart move, Rocky. A photo would be nice, but it isn't worth getting killed over. Discretion is the better part of valor, I submit. Yep, that's pretty much the way I felt, Rocky replied. So let me get this straight. The animal didn't speak to you, but you got the message that you would be killed if you took the picture. How do you explain that, I ask. I can't, replied Rocky. I absolutely can't. It looked me right in the eyes as I began to raise the camera, and at that exact moment, I knew I'd better not. It's like he was warning me not to, by sending me some kind of mental message. I don't know how to explain it, but it just stopped me cold. 
It knew what I was about to do, and it just wasn't going to let me take that picture. No way. What happened next? At that point, I flashed on the first one that was going for the bait. I look over toward it just in time to see it disappear into the trees. Then I look back at the big one right near me, and it was gone. I couldn't believe it. It was there, and then, that fast, it was gone. No noises and no motion caught my eye. It just vanished. I remember thinking, did I just imagine that? Then that fast, it's on my other side. Now it's standing behind the shrubs on my left, and he's growling at me. I can only see him from about the waist up, and he's growling at me. Well, that was it. I had enough. I was so scared, I was about to wet my pants again. I didn't think I would get out of there alive. I've seen bear, I've seen cougar, I've seen elk, and none of them ever had me scared. But these things had me real scared. I've never been that scared in my life, and I wasn't enjoying myself one bit. I was almost sure I was going to die. I turned my back on it and started running down the road. What happened to the other two that were making the noise behind you, I remind him. I don't know, and I don't care. I didn't ever see them, and at that point I wasn't looking anymore. I just wanted out of there in the worst way you can imagine. I didn't stop running till I was almost to the car. I kept looking back behind me to see if they were following me. Fortunately, they weren't. When I got to my car, I got out of there as fast as I could. When I got home, I was still shaking. I'm never going back there again. Yes, you are, Rocky. You're going back up there tomorrow, and I'm going with you. Long silence. It took a little more persuading, but Rocky finally consented to a return trip, if for no other reason than to prove to me and himself that he wasn't going crazy. He hoped to be able to show someone else the creatures that had confronted him at point-blank range and scared him worse than he had ever been scared before. Should I bring my bow? he finally asked. No, just a camera if you want. Before dawn the next morning, we met at the Blue Sky Mini Mart and gas station outside the town of Grand Ronde. We drove to the gate at the foot of the road and started to walk up the road. You watch, Rocky whispered. Since I didn't bring my bow, we'll see the elk herd. That's the way these things tend to go. I chuckled at the irony, but then it happened. We climbed the hill and break out into the clearing of an old clear cut, and there, in the middle of the road, was six or seven elk. They turned their rumps to us, and in the faint light before sunrise, I could see the big heart-shaped white rumps of the Roosevelt elk descending the embankment on the left side of the road, just 50 or 60 feet ahead of us. See, just like I said, whenever I don't bring my bow, I see the elk. I've been up here several times in the past couple of weeks and haven't seen the herd. I figured they left. Guess not. I could take reassurance in one thing. Rocky was every bit the sportsman and elk hunter he appeared to be. Someone can make up a story, but you can't make up an elk herd. It suddenly became still tougher to harbor the suspicion that Rocky was hoaxing me. It was still pretty dark, but not too dark to see a herd of elk dash off into the forest. Just after the elk left, we both heard a single scream come from a distant ridge. We continued our walk up the logging road as the darkness faded and dawn broke. Rocky was visibly nervous and edgy. I've never before seen someone chew tobacco and smoke a cigarette at the same time. When we got to the scene of yesterday's excitement, Rocky seemed relieved to find a fairly ordinary situation. He showed me all the bent and twisted trees, which looked very much like the real deal to me. The twist-offs were clearly not the work of wind and weather. He relocated the indistinct footprints he found, the bed of ferns and tree boughs, and the place where he found the scat. Some of the scat was still lying there, pretty well dried out and decomposed. He showed me the power line easement where the trees had been cleared and where he left the apples. I took out my camcorder and taped Rocky describing the whole story, pointing to where the apples were, explaining where he was when he saw the first one, how he moved toward it, where the noises came from behind him, and where the big one showed up beside him. It was still early, but it was after sunrise and completely light as I videotaped Rocky's description of all the events he experienced. He had goosebumps on his bare arms as he described his encounter with the big male. I was completely satisfied that the layout of the area was just the way Rocky described it in person and on the phone. In fact, I was impressed with how well everything matched the descriptions he offered. Certainly, this fellow was an experienced outdoorsman and a keen observer. 
He walked me all around the area, on and off the roads, and Rocky always knew what was going to be around the next bend. He never once failed to relocate a place where he had previously found an item of interest that he wanted me to see. There can be no doubt Rocky really knew these woods, and all of the finds he made were exactly as he described them. Rocky wanted very badly for me to see something tangible that would support the story of his experience. As we explored the area, he told me more than once he wanted to prove to me that he wasn't crazy, and he tried, and despite the fact that the Bigfoots didn't reappear for my benefit, I was also satisfied that Rocky wasn't crazy. The apples were gone from where he left them, and there were some indistinct scuff marks in the hard-packed earth around the spot. We found the twisted-off trees, intermittently placed along abandoned logging roads. They were too high up for a person to reach, too large a diameter for a person to break, and in some cases, the trees were so freshly broken that the leaves were still green on the broken treetops. Rocky and I walked back to where we parked the cars. He was disappointed that he was not able to show me more concrete evidence of his incredible experiences of yesterday. Trying to be positive, I said, Hey, it's better that you didn't. If you had marched me out into the woods, and we both seen a furry, two-legged animal running for the trees, I would have suspected that it was all staged for my benefit. We saw about as much as I expected to see, which is not much. But that's better, because I know that Bigfoots don't hang around for researchers like me to take video of with their camcorders. You did just fine, Rocky. I appreciate the time you spent showing me around your favorite hunting spot. Was Rocky lying about his experiences so he could get attention or recognition from a middle school science teacher and sometimes Bigfoot researcher? Definitely not. That is, not unless he's an operative for some sort of Mission Impossible style ruse that went flawlessly right down to the holographically projected elk that crossed the road right in front of us. Was Rocky misled or mistaken about what he saw? Highly unlikely. That wasn't some sort of fleeting, the thing that scampered across the road style sighting as most Bigfoot sightings are. This was easily the most detailed and involved multiple Bigfoot sighting at close range sighting that I have ever investigated. What he was claiming was truly extraordinary, yet the individual events he claims to have witnessed were completely consistent with the intimate and evasion tactics that have been described by many other witnesses. No one person has experienced so many in one event, to my knowledge, but nothing he described was completely new. Even the means of approaching the bait was consistent with reports, and even the evidence we collected at Skookum Meadows, the details of which Rocky could not have known. He described a creature crawling in low to the ground when approaching obvious bait. This is exactly the way we suspected the creature approached our bait on the Skookum expedition. In Rocky's case, the creatures tried to distract him with noises from behind that would provide the juvenile in front of him a chance to escape unseen. I've heard from several other witnesses who lost track of the Sasquatch they sighted under those identical circumstances. It seems to be a favorite trick of the Sasquatches. The locals won again, but barely. I'm guessing that they had a meeting after that episode to try and figure out why the usual intimidation procedures failed to work and why they had to pull out all the stops on this guy. Rocky gave them a run for their money because he was a very quick study and a very cool-headed field man. He almost got the photo we were after, but on the other hand, I almost got Rocky killed. Let's not dwell on that fact, if you please. Fortunately, Rocky knew just when to disregard the advice of a local Bigfoot investigator in favor of simply saving his own skin. I can live without the photo secure instead in the knowledge that we got an epic account of the deal and that no one got hurt. All's well that ends well. This terrifying encounter story was submitted to Bigfoot Case Files by Jared. It occurred October 1st, 1988 in Wyoming. He writes, Hi Lynn, okay, I'm doing it. I've had this written out in some form or another for 31 years. I've tried my best to cut the fat, but because it happened to me, more points seem more relevant to me versus what a casual listener might think. After my encounter, I told a few people, mostly family and close friends, none really believed me. At best, I got a few half-hearted questions, no ridicule though. 
so I kind of just kept it under my hat, searching for more info, learning everything I could. I've been going back and forth about sending this in. I've loaded it on your contact page three or four times now. My Day of Terror in the Woods I'm a year older than the PG film and have seen it pretty much my whole life. In the most basic and simplest of groupings, I think the majority of people who see that film come to one of two conclusions. A. People see a guy in a costume and a hoax. Case closed, the world is right again. B. People see an unknown living animal with a walking movement that is not human. Anything is possible, we don't know everything. I was always a group B and considered it possible they exist and even wanted them to exist. Even feeling that way and thinking you've accepted the possibility, that doesn't prepare you for the impact of them stepping into your reality. My father did 30 years in the US Army. Most of that time he was in special forces including two tours in Vietnam. I was taught weapon safety, shooting and hunting from a very early age. My encounter was in October 1988. I myself was in the Army at this time and stationed at Fort Carson in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I was on leave and at an old family friend's private property. The family still lives there and for their privacy concerns, all I will say on the location is it's south of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I was hunting for mule deer. We had been there many times before and I knew the area I was going to hunt. Now it's important I describe the lay of the land because its simple terrain and beauty also caused greater fear during my unwanted sighting and following encounter. The area I was to hunt was just off a main trail, probably midway up the hill or mountain. It was around 5.30 a.m. I drove into the area and parked my 77 CJ5. I was about 300 meters away from my stand, just below the crest of the terrain to keep it out of sight. The ground was covered in leaves. Walking quietly as possible, I made my way to the stand. Once at the stand, I climbed up and sat on the seat and then got real quiet while waiting for the sun. As the first rays of light started pushing back the dark, I could see. The area was pristine and beautiful, full of aspens and pines with a few outcrops of rock. I could just start to see through and in between the trees in all directions. In the summer you probably wouldn't be able to see 20 meters in any direction, but this time of year it was really an ideal hunting area. My stand was in a cluster of three trees with a wood platform that was framed in about 10 feet off the ground. They had a ladder strapped to one of the trees and the platform had a 2x4 hand shooting rail on all four sides with a wood bench seat. They had attached burlap on the handrail hanging down to the platform on three sides, leaving the uphill side clear. They also had a couple of sections of old camo netting tied to the tree above hanging loosely over the handrail to help conceal the stand. Once in the stand I could see downhill 200 plus meters before the land curved and dropped off below my line of sight. From that point the hill continued down another 300 meters or so and this was very steep. At the bottom of the hill was a stream only a couple of feet deep, 12 to 15 feet wide, about 50 meters of grass and shrubs and a second branch of the same stream. It was at best a foot deep and about 6 to 8 feet wide. From there the valley was another 100 meters wide or so before hitting a tree line and starting up the next hill. So this small valley was about 100 to 200 meters wide, across it where I was and about 400 to 600 meters long, going from my left to right. The left end of the valley was higher and everything flowed down to my right. The larger closer stream wasn't visible. My view was blocked by the hill I was on. I was hunting with my Schultz and Larson 270 Winchester bolt action rifle with a 3x9 Leopold scope. I also had a pistol, my Ruger Super Blackhawk 44 Meg with a 10.5 inch barrel. If a buck got close, I would use my pistol. I had already taken three whitetail and numerous hogs with it, and maybe a gator or two in my youth. During the first hour or so, the forest woke up, birds started to sing, and I could hear and see a couple of chipmunks playing here and there. Around 9 a.m. I could hear something large walking behind me higher up the hill. It was walking downhill towards me. I slowly spun around and got my rifle ready. Whatever it was continued slowly. It would take a few steps and then stop for a moment or two. As it continued, I could tell it passed by my elevation and was in the next draw just out of my sight. Damn it. I continued listening to it as it kept going down towards the stream. It was definitely on four legs and sounded like a deer. 
I considered getting down and tried to make it back to the trail with minimal noise, and then head over to the rise where it had passed. Ultimately, I decided to stay put. Who knows, more might be coming. If it crossed the little valley, I might be able to see it, and if it was a buck, I might get a shot on it. It had now been well over an hour since I first heard the animal walk past me. I was repositioning, and just as I finished moving, I heard an owl. Not a second or two later, I could hear something, probably that same deer, coming back uphill and coming fast. What the hell? Had it seen me move, I thought? I could tell it was further away this time, but it was running hard. It continued past my elevation and going uphill and further away. I was frustrated, hours of mashing Fanny sitting still on this hard bench, and I just blew my only chance so far and never even saw the damn thing. As I turned back to looking downhill, I noticed something new, and it was large and dark. It was at the opposite tree line by some shrubs and a dead tree lying on the ground. What the hell am I looking at? I kept thinking. From its movements and shape, it looked like a bear facing away from me, digging either in the fallen tree or just below it in the ground. I thought, cool, a bear, and a big bear at that. My first thought on size was it looked as big as two 55-gallon barrels wrapped in brown fur. It was still an unrecognizable shape and was about 400 to 500 meters away, line of sight. I lined my rifle up to use the scope to see this thing better. As I'm staring at it, I can see its hair is brown to reddish blonde, but the shape has me confused as to its orientation to me. As I'm scanning it all over, I start to make out what I'm seeing. It looks like two big hairy butt cheeks on the ground with a huge back going up to gigantic shoulders, all hairy and very muscular looking. No head is visible, whatever it is appears bent over looking at the ground. I swear my mind was like a computer going a million miles an hour searching through flashcards on animal pictures. Bear, no. Bison, no. Moose, no. Elk, no. Deer, no. Human, hell no. Not that size. The one animal on this planet it could be was a gorilla. What? I thought to myself. New species. The Yellowstone Mountain Gorilla. Ha ha. What? The animal I can see looks like a huge gorilla. I can see its backbone going down to a slightly tapered waist and two hairy butt cheeks. It's moving and its whole body is jerking from time to time. I assume it's pulling or digging into something. While my mind is trying to comprehend what I'm seeing, I become aware that my brain is starting to pull up and download an old animal file I've never seen live before. Slowly coming in, I start to realize what I'm looking at. As this is happening, I hear that owl again, and the gorilla. No, it's no damn gorilla. It's a Bigfoot. A real live Bigfoot. And it turns its body toward the sound of the owl. It wasn't sitting down, but squatting. Its feet are concealed by the grass. But it turned to its left like an ape using its arms and turned profile to me and somehow seemed to double in size. At that moment, I started to gasp and had to stop myself mid-gasp for fear it would hear me. I could tell it was chewing on something while looking out across the valley. It took two steps on all fours, arms first followed by its legs. This movement was exactly gorilla-like. The back legs were together and inside the front arms width. I couldn't tell if it was on knuckles or fist or palms. While on all fours, its back was higher in front and lower in the back end, just like an ape. It then stood up on two legs, and I truly quit breathing. I had to consciously control my breathing, and I was having problems keeping my eyes under control and the proper distance from the scope. I wanted desperately not to be there, but at the same time, I wanted to see more. My mind was in total disbelief in what I was witnessing. Even without the scope, it was huge. The scope made it look like King Kong. I watched it mill around, but I never got a good look at its feet. The grass concealed them. He was most definitely a male. Most of his skin was either black or a very dingy and dirty gray. His hair was varying lengths, up to six inches. The hair was about two inches on his legs. He didn't appear to have hair on his knees. It looked like he had two lighter colored calloused knee pads. As he stepped and walked around, his legs seemed to move differently than ours, like his hip joints are structured differently. His behind was extremely large, round and protruded outward. 
His legs were powerful looking and very muscular, although they appeared slightly shorter than they should be versus its total height. His upper body looked like a bodybuilder to the point of being ridiculous and terrifying with its proportions. I couldn't make out abs, his hair was too thick, but his pecs were defined and massive. His hair was longer on his upper back, three to four inches, versus his chest area, two inches. His arms were extremely long, not quite to his knees, but close. His hands were similar to ours, but his thumbs seemed small for its size, and not quite in the same place as ours. His palms looked slightly elongated. His nails were black or dark brown, it was hard to keep them in sight. His forearms were long and huge, with almost no hair on the top side. It did look like the hair was thicker and longer on the back side of his forearms. His upper arms were just incredible. The bicep and triceps took up the entire upper arm. His shoulders and trapezoid muscles looked way oversized. The traps went to where his ears should have been, but for the hair, I couldn't see any. I didn't think he even had a neck. His head looked like it was just set on top of his body, but a little more forward than ours. He kept looking off to my left and then back to the ground where he had been digging. I worried he was looking at my jeep, but where I parked, I couldn't see the valley at all. It was hard to get a solid look at his face. The hair on his head and beard was the longest of any place on him, about six inches, matted and nasty looking. I could make out a very wide face, slightly lighter in color. His nose appeared very wide and looked almost flat. His mouth appeared to protrude out similar to an ape, but nowhere near as pronounced. His eyes appeared far apart. It was difficult to see. His eyebrows and brow ridge shaded his eyes. His skin looked dark gray and very leathery, with deep wrinkles in the face and forehead. The couple of straight-on glimpses I got, he looked like an animal at best. At no time did he look like a human to me. It had been at least five full minutes watching him when I heard that owl again, and so did he. I watched him look for it, which was somewhere off to my left. He stared for a moment or two, and then turned and stared directly into my scope, and my heart stopped. The next parts happened faster than I could comprehend, and gave me no time to think about what was happening. As he was staring at me, his face transformed and went to sheer rage. His head snapped back and his mouth opened and closed like he was biting the air. Only a moment or two later, my ears and whole body shuddered from the impact of the roar blasting up the mountainside. The volume he created was impossible. No animal can carry that volume in both amount and loudness. I've heard lions roar, and that wasn't even close to this. Maybe you need a hundred lions. In the next instant, he took a couple of the fastest steps I've ever seen. He was in a slightly leaned forward position, moving in a cross-country skier type motion that had an odd swing of the legs, but was smooth and fast. His arm swing looked like his palms faced backwards throughout the motion. I was praying for him to stop and it to be a bluff charge. He kept coming. He covered the next 100 meters in just a few seconds and then hit all fours once and leapt the first stream and roared while in the air. He was still coming directly at me. He landed hands first, but as soon as his feet touched the ground, he was back upright and moving like lightning on two legs, crossing the next 50 meters and out of my line of sight in just a few seconds. I was scared before, but now that he was out of my sight, I got really scared. I wanted to jump down and run to my jeep. With the speed I just saw, I didn't think I could cover the 300 meters before he would catch me. If by some miracle I did beat him there, my jeep was a rag top. What protection would that provide? Then I heard another roar, followed by a splash, and I knew he just hit the closer, larger stream and was at the bottom of my hill. Oh shit, he is still coming. I tried to compose myself, took my rifle off safety, and took the hammer strap off my pistol. Another roar blasted up the hill. Damn, I'm about to die. I hear what sounds like a freight train coming up the hill. I can start to see the tops of the lower downhill trees moving like they were hit by a bus. Another roar, and the tops of the moving trees are getting closer. He is still out of my sight, but is coming uphill like a missile. The tops of some of the trees and branches are breaking off. Another roar, and I hear what sounds like a slapping sound. What is that? Then I realized 
That's his feet hitting the rock outcrop just below my sight line. Then, there he is. A true monster at my 12 o'clock, running straight at me, a little over 200 meters away, mad as hell, screaming at me. He is huge. I send a warning shot just over his head. His scream stops, but that's it. I had hoped the crack of the supersonic round and pressure wave would get his attention and scare him off. He purposely hits a pine tree, 15 to 20 feet tall, and shears it in half at his shoulder height. I chamber another round. He is going from upright to all fours every couple of steps. He is grabbing and ripping the smaller trees out of the ground, using them to gain speed up the slope. A cloud of leaves and debris is behind him. I steady myself and send another round. I put this round maybe 10 feet short of him into the ground, right in front of his face while on all fours. The round explodes dirt and rocks up, and his body jolts instantly. I don't know if the round ricocheted, or if it was dirt or rocks blown into his face or eyes, but he slowed down. I chambered another round, only one more in the magazine, and it's pistol time. He stands and roars at me again. I raised my rifle. This time, it's going in the boiler room or between his eyes. He turned to his right, going sideways to me, and I pause. He has to be eight to nine feet tall even hunched over like he is, and at least 600 pounds. He stops his charge and takes cover behind a large boulder and a couple of trees, and roars at me again. He is now only 60 to 70 meters away, looking at me. I have the crosshairs right between his eyes, which are now red, wild, and demonic looking. He's growling at me like a dog, this low, guttural growl that I could feel in my chest. The growling shows his teeth. They look like an orangutan's, yellow, huge, and square. One upper tooth is broken off, jagged with about half missing. His face has an overall look like he has Down syndrome, and for some reason, that scares me even more. He's making all sorts of noises, roars, screams, and some type of clicking sound while slapping and hitting the ground in trees he's hiding behind. I get the feeling he's working up the courage for the final charge. I make the conscious decision to kill him, and am now waiting for my shot. But he quits giving me a meaningful shot, and keeps his head and chest behind the trees. Then, further to my left, I hear another huge roar, and my heart and hopes sink. There are two of them. These things, according to the scientific world, aren't supposed to exist, and here I am being attacked by one, and having a second one somewhere near my jeep. My next rational thoughts are I need to take care of the closest threat first, then reload hopefully in time to use the rifle against the second one. I can see his knee, I can blow this one's knee apart, then hopefully it will fall and open up a kill shot for my last rifle round. Then I have to reload faster than I ever have, chamber around and try to acquire the other one. Before I can shoot to shatter his knee, the furthest one started making strange gibberish chattering sounds. I still haven't seen the other one, but the closer one to me answered in a similar type of sound patterns. I had my rifle trained toward the first one behind the trees. At the same time, I kept glancing to my left, trying to see if the other one is coming. This went on for 20 to 30 seconds. The next thing I know, I see this one behind the tree, walking away, and he is already near the crest of the hill. He used the trees as cover and backed off at least 50 meters through the leaves without making a sound I could hear. How? As he went over the crest of the hill, he faced me and roared. Seconds later, so did the other one. The second one was still out of sight, but now sounded closer to the first male. I can now make out that they are walking together and are below the crest of the hill, just beyond my sight, going to my right. Each one would make some type of chatter sound with a yell and growl here and there, back and forth. It sounded like they were talking to each other. What kind of animal are they? It got to where I could no longer hear them walking and their voices were more faint. I surveyed my area and then topped off my rifle with a couple more bullets. I decided to get down and head for my jeep. I could still barely hear them as I got to the ground. This was the most terrifying part. The leaves were so loud. Trying to be quiet and keep looking back, it took everything I had to keep from running. I knew if I did, panic would set in. As I crested the hill, I stopped dead in my tracks. I could see my jeep and both doors were wide open and I started to shake. 
Just as I got to the jeep, I could see the leaves were disturbed in a path all around it. As I got in and cranked up the motor, one of them roared and then the other. I drove out as fast as possible without wrecking. I went straight to my hotel room and spent the night on the floor between the bed and wall, all doors locked, all guns loaded in hand, and tried to get some sleep. Laying on the bed, I felt exposed just like I did in that tree stand. I did write down all the events with as much detail as I could. I still have those sheets of paper 31 years later. Had I not been in the army, I probably would have never gone in the woods again. But I was in combat arms and we averaged 160 days a year in the woods, training downrange in Fort Carson, and at times I had to pull guard duty sometimes at 3 a.m. solo. Those were long, scary nights. I heard every noise. I may have had my M16, but I didn't have any live ammo, but it at least got me back on the horse. Since then, I've played this scenario out a million times. Why me? Why then? What could have happened? Why? 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 Over the years, I've come to a few conclusions. Number one, not only do they exist, they have a language. Two, I know the owl was the other unseen one and was probably watching me the entire time. Three, it's a good thing I didn't make a dash from my jeep. I probably would have ran right into the second one. Four, I don't want to think about the possible outcome of being on the ground in between two of them. Five, the other one was probably older and bigger and made the aggressive one stop the attack and leave. Why, I don't know. And if it was bigger, I'm glad I didn't see it. Six, Somehow, I think it knew I made the decision to kill it, and it kept hidden after that. How? In the years since, I have spent a lot of time searching, trying to learn everything I could. As its face looked to me, the one thing I found that it had the most resemblance was Homo habilis. The only difference is the nose. While this one had huge flaring nostrils, you could not see directly into them. I think it's called a hooded nose versus the type of the Homo habilis reconstructed nose. Thanks, Jared. Some of the greatest stories of encounters with Bigfoot come from Ape Canyon, a gorge along the southeast shoulder of Mount St. Helens in the state of Washington. The following accounts from Ape Canyon are excerpts from Chapter 3 of Roger Patterson's book, do abominable snowmen of America really exist? Giant hairy apes of Mount St. Helens terrify miners and baffle everyone. For sheer excitement and mystery, the Mount St. Helens episode rates number one with me. From the very start, it was an odd one. I have lived in Yakima, Washington for 28 years and have never heard of the hairy apes of Mount St. Helens. Although it is only 70 miles from home as the crow flies, I had to go to California to find out about them. There, Betty Allen had a number of newspaper clippings of the startling events that happened in and around the vicinity of that mountain, mainly since 1924. In that year, a group of rugged miners had fled down from the mountains, leaving the mine they had been working for three or four years. They claimed to have been attacked by a bunch of huge and hairy creatures, barely escaping with their lives. Betty had wanted more news from that area, so I promised when I returned home I'd go there and look further into the matter. Prentice Beck, a longtime friend and business associate, accompanied me on this trip. Prentice is a believer in the subject, and as we headed over the mountain pass, he remarked in an excited tone, to think we've been this close to something all this time and didn't know it. Our first stop was to be at Mr. Ray Wallace's at Toledo, Washington. He had been in on Bigfoot happenings starting in 1958 in the Bluff Creek area. A few years back, he had moved to Toledo and set up a business there. Mr. Wallace has changed his mind considerably about who or what caused all the trouble for him while he was building the road up the mountain in Northern California. He no longer thinks someone was trying to pull a trick on him, but is sure now that giant prehistoric-like men were and are in that area. He had a tape recording that was supposed to be a Bigfoot screaming inside a cave. As we listened to it, it didn't sound like what Rod and I had heard in the woods that night we stayed in the cabin. Although we're not sure what it was we had heard, so I cannot say one way or another about the authenticity of Ray's tape. However, Betty Allen had told us that Mr. Wallace had played the tape to a fellow that had heard one howling on a mountain in the Bluff Creek area. 
He was sure it had been one because of the giant human-like tracks found close by the next morning. This gentleman said Ray's tape sounded very close to the same sound he heard that night. Ray said he was sure that the same kind of creatures that are in Northern California existed up around Mount St. Helens, as he had heard a number of stories in recent years coming from loggers and people who had been up there. He also told us of the whereabouts of an old gentleman that claimed to have shot one of the creatures. The next morning, we headed toward the foothills just out of Kelso. We found Mr. Fred Beck living in a small cabin with his son. At first, he was reluctant to speak much of his experience. I suppose because of all the ridicule he had taken over the years. But after he seen that we were sincerely interested in what had happened to him and the tremendous ordeal he had gone through, he soon loosened up and became friendly. There are only two of the old miners left, Mr. Beck and one other who doesn't wish his name used. This is Mr. Beck's astonishing story. Back in about 1921, he and four other prospectors, Gabe Lefevre, Amarian Smith, Roy Smith, and John Peterson, had started work on a mine in a canyon on the east side of Mount St. Helens' tapered ledge. They had built a solid cabin halfway up the canyon wall on a tapered ledge. It was an easy place to get to, yet sheltered some from wind and weather. At that time, there were no roads in that area, and they had to haul their ore out to Kelso, 50 or 60 miles by mule. From time to time, they came upon huge, suspicious-looking tracks, which they thought might be those of a big, wild, renegade Indian. They packed their rifles with them most of the time. Then one day, as they were returning to their cabin, they saw a tremendous giant looking out from behind a tree. One of the group quickly fired his rifle, shooting at the thing's head. He was sure he had killed it. However, when they reached the spot where he should have fallen, there was nothing. As they looked up, they were surprised to see the giant running over the hill. The next day, they encountered another one close by the edge of the canyon. This time, Mr. Beck fired three shots, hitting the creature in the back each time. The giant tumbled over the cliff into the canyon. Thereafter, it has been called Ape Canyon. They hunted for him, but great torrents of water coming off the mountain flooded the canyon floor, washing away anything that fell into it. They did not find a sign of him. As usual, they returned to their cabin and had a good supper and settled down for the night. Then it happened. Tremendous boulders began pelting their cabin roof, followed by loud wailing screams that echoed hideously off the canyon walls. The giants had attacked. They jumped on the roof, rammed their huge bodies against the door, and tore at the cabin's walls with their hands. If the miners had not built the cabin, roof and all, out of solid 10-inch logs, it would never have held together. This fierce attack kept up all night, and by dawn there were five scared and wary miners who were thankful to see the light of day. No doubt this unexpected attack was brought on by the miners themselves when they shot and wounded or killed two of the giants. When the miners were sure they had gone, they quickly gathered up what was needed to make the trip to town and hurriedly took off down the mountain. Mr. Beck warned them all to say nothing of their experience, as surely no one would believe them. But halfway to town, they met two young prospectors, and one of the party spilled the beans, telling them of the terrible night before. The two laughed and said they must have had a whiskey party and dreamed the whole thing up. This made Beck furious, and he threatened to shoot their heads off if they said another word. The two then went quietly on their way, and the miners resumed their trip to town. Newspapers ran big stories on their being attacked, which some folks believed, while others just laughed and called the whole thing a wild tale. Law enforcement officers and reporters formed a posse and went into the area. They didn't find any hairy ape-like men, although they did find many huge tracks and the miners' cabin torn up badly. The miners didn't care about the cabin as they never went back, leaving their mind to anyone brave enough to work it. Mr. Beck seems to be an honest and straightforward person, with a keen sense, even now he is in his 80s. I believe he told me the truth according to the best of his recollection. After our first meeting, I had the privilege of meeting with Mr. Beck many times, and he always tried to help in any way he could. Once he let me tape his whole story of the attack. You can listen to that interview at the end of this story. Another point is that Mr. Beck described the creatures he had seen to closely resemble the ones that had been seen in Canada and California, although he had never heard that such creatures had been reported anywhere else. We thanked Mr. Beck for all his information and headed up to Mount St. Helens. As we stopped in Spirit Lake, named so by the Indians because evil spirits were supposed to have lurked there, 
and soon learned that we came the wrong way to get to Ape Canyon, as the road does not go around the east side of the mountain. The next morning, we stopped at a little logging town by the name of Cougar. We had breakfast at the only cafe in town and asked if anyone had heard lately of the giant hairy apes. The waitress replied smartly, Yeah, there's one right across the street. He owns the gas station. Then, of course, the whole place had a good laugh at our expense. More questioning brought more chuckles and wisecracks. So I said, Wait a minute. I'll be right back. I went to the pickup and brought back tracks, tape recorder, and hundreds of clippings from the Northern California area. After I showed these and had my say, a few hundred words, you could have heard a pin drop like a falling tree. No more wisecracks or laughing. Instead, slowly, one after another, they would say something like, well, I heard this person say such and such about seeing tracks up there, or this one or that one seeing one of the creatures. I brought this out to prove a point. Many people would try to pass the subject off as a joke, even if they knew some valuable information such as these people eventually began to tell us. At first, we were probably just a couple of thrill-seeking tourists. They tried to bluff their way, hoping we would give up and go away. I have run into this situation many times in the past, and it usually works out the same. Of course, we must realize that most of these people are good, reliable citizens, a little confused on the whole matter, and not sure of themselves either way. Consequently, they try to pass it off as a good laugh. Nonetheless, they did come up with some valuable information. They told us of a club called the Ape Cave Explorers. Some of the members lived in the area around Cougar, so we contacted a few of them and found out some startling facts. They told us the caves around Mount St. Helens are supposed to be the largest lava tubes in the world. There is one such cave that opens at the head of a canyon appropriately called Ape Cave. At this writing, I have not yet explored any of these caves. However, this summer I am planning an expedition into the area with some device that may attract these giant creatures close enough for a picture. We're planning the same type of expedition in the near future into Northern California. As we traveled down the Lewis River, we learned of a fellow named Charlie Arian, who lives at Woodland, Washington. Charlie has a ranch close to the mouth of the Lewis River, where it empties into the Columbia River. He related this story to us. A Portland couple had reported to the local sheriff's office that they had seen a huge creature walking upright along the banks of the Lewis River while they were fishing from a boat. Of course, it scared them badly, as it was only about a hundred feet away. After Charlie read the article about the incident in the local newspaper, his first thought was if something had been seen, it surely would have left tracks. With this in mind, he and his family set out to search the riverbanks, which were not far from his ranch. They were well rewarded. They found hundreds of huge human-type tracks measuring a whopping 22 inches long and 10 inches across the ball of the foot. As with most riverbanks, the soil was sandy, so the prints showed up perfectly. Charlie also had a logging operation and spends much of his time in the woods, so he knows what tracks look like. He said he did not see how those tracks could have been faked, as the depth in the sand showed tremendous weight. He also mentioned he had seen the same type of tracks, except smaller, up near Mount St. Helens. I have a number of newspaper clippings from the area that date back as far as 1924. Here are a few of them, plus some eyewitness accounts from central Washington. Longview Times. Wild-eyed rifleman fleeing Devils of Peak launched Legend of Mount St. Helens Apes. Editor's Note. A durable legend about the mysterious hairy apes of Mount St. Helens keeps cropping up, as was the case a few months ago when loggers in the area of Ape Canyon waggishly posted hairy ape road signs. Here in the first of two articles, a Colombian reporter interviews a man who was there when the legend began. By Ted Van Arsdal, Colombian staff reporter. Chalachi. The July morning in 1924 at the Spirit Lake Ranger Station was beautiful, like a morning is in the high country. Bill Welch, 68 of Chalachi, recalled. What made this morning so different was the man coming from the direction of the ranger station with a rifle in his hand. Welch could see that the visitor was pretty wild-eyed, and he recognized him as a man who had a cabin with several others about five or six miles from the station, at the head of what was called Muddy Creek. Well, I got him, the man said as he slowed down in front of Forest Guard Welch. Got who or what? The Mountain Devil. You mean a cougar? No, the Mountain Devil. Welch, standing outside the barn, eyeing this newcomer, 
warily recalled him as a man who had been at the station two or three weeks earlier. Permits were needed to build a fire outside of the campgrounds in Spirit Lake, and this man, in his 50s, had stopped in and asked permission to build a fire in his cabin. Permits were not needed for this. In the course of the earlier conversation, the man told Welch that he and several others had a mine near the cabin. He also volunteered the information that mountain devils had been trailing and bothering the men in the last several years. He hadn't seen these devils, but had viewed some of their tracks. Welch had thought that this was a little far-fetched. He didn't think there are any wolves or wolverines in the area. It's the first I heard of it, he had said. If you run into any of those mountain devils, let me know. I will, the mountain miner said. Now, standing facing the gun-carrying mountain man, Welch began wondering if he could get close enough to grab the rifle, and also started worrying about his wife at the ranger station. Had this definitely disturbed newcomer murdered her? As the talk continued, Welch was relieved to see his wife come out of the door of the ranger station. The visitor was insisting that he had shot the mountain devil and that it had slid over a bluff at the cabin. He also said that his partners are in a car near the ranger station after coming down from the cabin with him. Welch still thought this man had blown his top when he went over to the touring car, which carried three men in the front and two in the back. He found the others were just as wild as he was, sitting there clutching their guns. The man who had walked over to see Welch vowed that they were going back home and would never come back here again. The five left shortly afterward, headed for Kelso. Welch didn't know at the time that he was getting involved in a key incident of the legend of the Mount St. Helens hairy apes. The ape label quickly took predominance over the mountain devils, and the alleged existence of the creatures has been a subject of recurrent speculation over the years. Welch talked to his wife, who had been the first person to encounter the departing miners after they left the cabin, and she told him about the man coming to the door with a rifle across his shoulders, an incident she still remembers vividly today. The miner's eyes were glazed from some evidently shocking experience as he informed Mrs. Welsh. We got him, we got him. Well, what? The mountain devil. There was a pause, and the miner explained. Well, you know, your husband told us to let him know if we ever saw anything. So I stopped to tell him we saw one and killed it. But we're going out and never coming back. Mrs. Welch hardly knew what he was talking about, but told the gun toter that her husband was out at the barn, and he walked toward the barn to meet Welch. After the carload of men had left, Welch called Jim Huffman, a district ranger at Amboy, and told them what had happened. He still wondered if the miners might have encountered a wolverine. This is a vicious little animal that can wreck cabins and destroy what it doesn't eat, Welch said. There were rumors of wolverines on Mount St. Helens about this time, but no one, so far as the forest guard knew, had seen one. More details were soon forthcoming from the miners, who were interviewed by a reporter after they reached Kelso on July 12th. Fight with big apes reported by miners was one headline on the reporter's account, which he termed the strangest story to come from the Cascade Mountains. The returning miners, Marion Smith, his son Roy Smith, Fred Beck, Gabe Lefevre, and John Peterson had encountered the fabled mountain devils, or mountain gorillas of Mount St. Helens, according to the reporter, who also stated, The men had been prospecting a claim on the Muddy, a branch of the Lewis River about eight miles from Spirit Lake. They saw four of the huge animals, which are about seven feet tall, were about 400 pounds, and walk erect. Smith and his companions have seen the tracks of the animals several times in the last six years, and Indians have told of the mountain devils for 60 years, but none of the animals have ever been seen before. Smith met up with one of the animals and fired at it with a revolver. Thursday, Fred Beck shot one, the body falling over a precipice. That night, the animals bombarded the cabin where the men were staying with large showers of rocks, many of them large ones, knocking chunks out of the log cabin. Many of the rocks fell through a hole in the roof, and two of the rocks struck Beck, one of them rendering him unconscious for nearly two hours. The animals have the appearance of huge gorillas. They are covered with long black hair. Their ears are about four inches long and stick straight up. They have four toes, short and sturdy. The tracks are 13 to 14 inches long. These tracks have been seen by forest rangers and prospectors for years. The prospectors built a new cabin this year, and it is believed it is close to a cave occupied by the animals. Mr. Smith believes he knows the location of the cave. 
On the evening that the news was sent by wire from Kelso, Welch recalled Frank Slim, a Seattle newspaper man, and Bert Hammerstrom, a freelance writer and brother-in-law of Clarence Darrow, arrived by car at the Spirit Lake Ranger Station. They had quite a trip in reaching the place, as nine hours were required for a drive from Castle Rock to Spirit Lake in 1924, Welch remembered. He said the road was not good, and in some places a driver had to try three or four roads before finding the right one. A side road might meander off into nothing. Welch later recalled the date as July 14, when the news had been received in Seattle, and when he reached the ranger station, he and his friend were ready with a lot of questions about the apes, who were portly and rained rocks as large as a man's head on the miner's cabin, and as Welsh told the story, had tried to pry the cabin into the Smith Creek abyss. Huffman, the district ranger, also had arrived at the ranger station, and the group planned a trip of inspection to the now famous cabin. Legendary Mount St. Helens ape men called legitimate. Longview Times. The legend of the ape men of Mount St. Helens returns like hay fever with summer weather. The story of the ape men of the beautiful conical mountain situated in the Cascade Range of Southwest Washington is a favorite in the area, but it just may have some basis in fact. There is more basis to support it than Nepal's Yeti or Northern California's Bigfoot and probably as much as Loch Ness Monster. Last summer, two different Portland groups who visited the region reported sighting the monsters, usually described as from 7 to 10 feet tall, hairy and either white or beige colored. Three persons in a car on a lonely forest road said they saw one of the creatures when it flashed across the headlight beams of their car near the wilderness area which includes such places as Ape Canyon. A Portland couple fishing on the Lewis River south of the mountain saw a huge beige figure, bigger than any human, amble off into the brush. Old-timers aren't surprised, just amused. The ape man legend actually is older than the white man's habitation of the Pacific Northwest. Forestry employees have investigated many reports of the strange creatures. According to Indian legend, the apes were ferocious Sahetic Indians, a band of renegades, much like giant apes in appearance, who lived like wild animals in the secluded caves of the Cascades. The first recorded encounter of the apes with white man was in 1924. A group of five prospectors rushed into Kelso to report that a group of great ape-like creatures had attacked them in the middle of the night. The miners said they had been working a mine on the east slope of Mount St. Helens. During the daytime, they saw some of the apes and fired at them to halt an apparent attack. One of the apes appeared to have been hit and rolled into a deep ravine. That night, according to the account, the ape men hurled rocks onto the cabin and danced and screamed until daylight. Then came the great ape hunt of 1924. Law enforcement officers and a flock of newspaper men made up a posse that went into the area. The armed searchers fired at anything that moved, so the report went. They returned to tell of finding huge footprints, but no apes. The legend grew from that point for several years, then subsided with only sporadic reports of traces of the apes. Responsible persons, experienced mountaineers and skiers, have given credence to the story. Bob Lee of Portland, a leader of the 1961 Himalayan expedition, and advisor to last year's Himalayan expedition, said last year he had a strange experience. Lee has never claimed to have seen the apes, but said there was something strange on the high slopes of the mountains. He was a member of the party that searched for Jim Carter, an experienced skier and mountaineer who vanished on the mountain in 1950. His disappearance remains a mystery. At the same time, Lee was a member of the Seattle Mountain Search and Rescue Unit. He described the search for Carter as the most eerie experience I have ever had. He said that every time he was cut off from the rest of the search party, he felt somebody was watching him. Carter, he said, had climbed the mountain with some companions on a warm, clear Sunday. He left the group to take a picture and said he would ski to the left of the group. He was never seen again. His tracks, however, indicate that he suddenly took off down the hill in a wild, death-defying run that no experienced skier would make unless he was pursued, Lee said. The tracks went in the direction of Ape Canyon, but no trace of Carter or his equipment was found although the area was combed for two weeks. Lee recalled stories of about 25 persons who claimed they have encountered the monsters during a 20-year period. The canyon name for the apes is a lonely, ominous spot in the wild area. It extends to a point near Ape Cave, 
thought to be the longest unitary lava tube in the world. There have been many reports of footprints in the area. Some are described as being about 18 inches long and seemingly human. Unless the creatures are really fuzzy throwbacks, the lost Indian theory seems most likely to some of the fans of the mystery. It has given rise to some suggestions, one of which is to leave well enough alone. The government might take over and shove benefits and subsidies at them, retroactive to the Ice Age. At that, as well as costing a lot of money, would ruin a very good legend. Ape Canyon Holds Unsolved Mystery, Longview Times, August 1963, by Marge Davenport, Oregon Journal Staff Writer. Spirit Lake, Washington. Ape Canyon, the legendary home of the hairy apes of Mount St. Helens, apparently swallowed an experienced mountaineer and expert skier in May 1950. No trace of Jim Carter, 32, who disappeared from a 20-member climbing party from Seattle was found, although teams of the Northwest's most proficient mountain rescue units combed the area for weeks. Carter's complete disappearance is an unsolved mystery to this date, declared Bob Lee, well-known Portland mountaineer who was a member of the exclusive Worldwide Alpine Club, a leader of the 1961 Himalayan expedition and advisor to the 1963 American expedition. Lee said he had never seen one of the monsters, but that there certainly was evidence that there was something strange on the high slopes of the mountain. He was convinced of this during the search for Carter, he said. Dr. Otto Trott, Lee Stark and I finally came to the conclusion that the apes got him said Lee seriously. Lee, a member of the Seattle Mountain Search and Rescue Unit at the time, describes the hunt for Carter in Ape Canyon as the most eerie experience I have ever had. He said that every time he got cut off from the rest of the searchers during the long hunt, he got the feeling that somebody was watching me. I could feel the hair on my neck standing up. It was eerie. I was unarmed except for my ice axe, and believe me, I never let go of that. At this point in Lee's story, I could feel my own hair standing up a bit. Readying a shoulder pack for a safari to Ape Canyon to try and determine whether there is any truth to the ape stories, I began to feel a little dubious about the whole expedition. The rest of Lee's tale about the Seattle man's disappearance didn't do much to reassure me. It seems that Carter had climbed Mount St. Helens with a group from Seattle on a warm, clear Sunday. On the way down the mountain, he left the other climbers near a landmark called Dog's Head at the 8,000 foot level. He told them he would ski around to the left and take a picture of the group as they skied down to the timberline. That was the last time that anyone saw Carter. The next morning, searchers found a discarded film box at the point where he had taken a picture. From here, Carter evidently took off down the mountain in a wild, death-defying, taking chances that no skier of his caliber would take unless something was terribly wrong or he was being pursued says Lee, who was one of the first searchers to reach Carter's ski tracks. He jumped over two or three large crevices and evidently was going like the devil. When Carter's tracks reached the precipitous signs of Ape Canyon, the searchers were amazed to see that Carter had been in such a hurry that he went right down the steep canyon walls. But they did not find him at the bottom of the canyon as they expected. We combed the canyon one end to the other for five days. Sometimes there were as many as 75 persons in the search party, but no sign of Carter or his equipment was found, Lee says. After two weeks, the search was called off. Lee, who has lived in the Northwest most of his life, recalls there were about 25 different reports of people attacked by ape-like men in the St. Helens and Cascade areas over a 20-year period. One was a group of Boy Scouts from Centralia, he said. Couldn't we check on that story? As near as he could remember, several of the boys were taken off the mountain were hysterical after being attacked by the ape men. Director Dick Whitney of the Regional Boy Scout Office in Olympia, Washington, promised to look for a record of the incident. To our surprise, he called back to say that he had located the name of the leader and the troop involved in the incident. It was a troop under the late Scoutmaster Pease from Centralia, he said. Whitney promised to have Pease's son, who works for the state of Washington, call the journal as soon as he returns from vacation. Miners, scouts, Indians, mountaineers, and most recently an editor, and other reliable Portland residents, the list of persons who have seen the hairy apes of Mount St. Helens is impressive. Author Biography Roger Patterson was no ordinary filmmaker. He managed to film a shaky 60-second film of a Bigfoot, the creature that the Native Americans call Sasquatch. 
Patterson was a well-respected rodeo rider. During the 1960s, he developed an interest in the Bigfoot, an unknown creature seen for years in California, Oregon, and Washington, writing a small self-published book. Patterson and his friend Bob Gimlin became famous for their well-known Patterson-Gimlin film of a purported Bigfoot Sasquatch in Bluff Creek, California. Patterson died in 1972, spending every penny he made from the film continuing his search for the creature. The following is the interview of Fred Beck by Roger Patterson, posted by Todd Prescott on his YouTube channel, The Sasquatch Archives. We just mining in there and working on our tank. And uh, about two years before we had the contact with him, we threw a track standing on the muddy. We didn't have to worry, we had to tap it in from the beginning. We were fishing both of them. I see. But we heard, what is that? We heard the rumors people threw up the year before that. Found the same thing as you've seen them, you know, big traps up there. One fellow was telling about fishing, and they're still fishing with them on the bank. And when he, uh, <coughs> when he came out, it was a big, 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 like a mound. Hey, hey, big fella. How do you speak? He took me just make them all on the rock. He come out of there, sat and went in. And nobody believed him. But not like you not. Father in law stayed with me. He believed it. And uh, he said that when I didn't lie, I thought you knew him. He said that no one was scared to come out of there. But, and he said he knew there wasn't no human. So, and uh, then when we uh, were in traps there, we never thought so much about it. And my father in law was telling about these old people. Shot. 
I have left over there. He said, his heart going. He said, don't run, don't run, man. don't run. He said, that, uh, he won't go far. I said, I put three shots through that fool's head. He said, he won't go far. So he got up on the ridge, looked down there, he was going, just jumping. Looked like a thing was 12, 14 feet. Yeah, right. The old man took a couple more shots at him. And the old man said, thank God, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I was kind of like, you know, I never said it in there. And so I hit him in the sun. Two shots, two. Well, yeah. we got away with all that. Well, now, the, the, the traps that you've seen uh, uh, before, you, you would just meet it around how big? Well, in 1980, it was amazing. Two detectives were that with us. Reporter. And uh, they imagined the tracks. Down the ridge, we waited probably a hundred yards. I don't know what that far. 
there was uh, one of the first ones that went off a compression, run down, and the gorge, and I shot him in the back, three shots. And I could hear the bullets hit him, and I see the fur fly on his back. I shot very hard. And uh, he stopped, and he just fell uh, right over the front place. And then he hit the tooth down into the canyon. And he fell in the eighth canyon. Yeah. And the uh, sun came out in the afternoon, that water was, the river torrent was down, it didn't wash anything out, it fell in there. And I, that's the reason I don't know whether they're human or not. If I couldn't kill them, but I hit. Well, how would you describe, Mr. Beck, as far as uh, what they look like in their in their body and in their head? Well, they were tall. They were wide and old. They looked to me like they were eight foot tall, and they were tall. And they were like a man. A little on his waist. And big, chest, big uh, shoulders on his chest, and uh, and their neck was what kind of what they call bull neck, you know, they're not like that. Right, they come here. Mm. No neck at all, hardly. And that's it. And then their ears, uh, the protruders out like ours do, and the big one, and the hair all of them, you could tell them about them. Did they have hair on their face? Or could you, did you ever? No, let's see, I, never, I don't believe they did. I, I believe they did have hair on their face. But not as much as... No. <coughs> yeah, that would be. Sure. Okay. How about um, their nose? Oh, I couldn't have, but I was... Uh, they seem to have a... have a pug nose, a flat nose, kind of flat. And their eyes? Oh, I can... No, it means excited, you know, you know. Sure. It's very good detail when you're excited, but I know one thing is they wasn't no human. Uh, they did, did go walk, walk upright. They always, yeah. Did you ever see I've one? I've seen one on the floor. They yeah. always walked upright. Their arms probably, was the arm or down below the hip. Long. The, I'd say they did down below the, the, their knees. Yeah. I knees. Long arms. Hmm. And big arms. <laughs> What, what uh, would you estimate maybe for weight? Uh, uh, for they're they're pretty heavy. I'd, I'd say they Six or eight hundred pounds, right? you know, just estimate it. Sure. And maybe more, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. The way it up, but when there's something down on the ground, I can just show it. I see the, you know, I have to have some idea about it. I say the way it's that much out, eight, nine hundred pounds or more, because it made it a deep imprint in the dirt. See, there's so much rock up there, you know. Only you can see them in places where there's sand, you know. Sure. <coughs> well, now, after you had the attack, it, did you... What happened then, the next morning? Well, we come out. Out of there. Come down. I found all of you. I was so excited and scared. And I told him, we, he promised to never tell nobody, because I said it wouldn't do, people wouldn't believe it, don't tell anybody. He said, I won't, I won't. But he did. He went down to the lake, and the rangers down there <coughs> knew him. He was so excited, he found, found, uh, took him in another room and talked to him, and he acknowledged what was the trouble was. And they said that they believed him because the old man had been a hunter, they knew him. And, they always have with their Indian himself hunting. Until they never know little things they ever scared, no arm or anything like that. And then he went to kill someone and tore some of his friends down there. <coughs> then a newspaper newspaper reporter. He was a merry time, day and night. Have they ever heard of anything, anybody before this? Did I you don't remember think so. You never, never really didn't believe it. I see. Well, we sure thank you for this interview and the. Scattered across the North American continent are many ghost towns, places that were once vibrant and alive but are now long dead and abandoned. Remnants of what once was can often still be found old schools, churches, or other buildings, usually in a ramshackle state of decay, standing, albeit perilously, 
serving as the only reminder that a community once thrived on the spot. The reasons a town can die are many and varied. In some cases, the town was bypassed by a railroad or highway. Other communities disappear simply because they have exhausted the natural resources which drew people to the area in the first place. Mining towns come to mind. Wars, natural disasters, political wrangling and the like can all be reasons one community might be abandoned in favor of another. Perhaps T. Lindsay Baker, author of Ghost Towns of Texas, said it best when he defined a ghost town as a town for which the reason for being no longer exists. Sometimes, though, you come across the story of a town that was abandoned for reasons other than those already mentioned. In a few cases, towns were deserted for reasons so unique and terrifying that they almost defy belief. One such case is that of Portlock, Alaska. The remains of what was once Portlock, Port Chatham, technically two communities but so close together I will simply use the singular Portlock for this article, sit on the far southwest edge of the Kenai Peninsula, not too far to the northeast of the more well-known Kodiak Island. The settlement was named after Captain Nathaniel Portlock of the Royal Navy, who landed on the peninsula in 1787. Some Alaska publications say travel to Portlock is possible via ATV, but most locals would dispute it. The only real way to see Portlock is to travel there by boat or bush plane. If you were able to actually get to the abandoned town, you would still be able to see the remains of what was once a healthy village. At one time, there was a cannery, a chromite mine, and a territorial boarding school for the children of the Kenai Peninsula. The town bustled enough that the government deemed a U.S. post office necessary and opened up a branch there in 1921. Everything changed, however, when every resident of Portlock picked up stakes and left en masse in 1949. Unlike most doomed communities, which die agonizingly slow deaths, Portlock ceased to exist almost overnight. What could have caused such a sudden and total mass exodus? A story from the Anchorage Daily News, April 15, 1973, may sum up the tale best. Portlock began its existence sometime after the turn of the century as a cannery town. In 1921, a post office was established there, and for a time the residents, mostly natives of Russian Aleut extraction, lived in peace with their picturesque mountain and sea setting. Then, sometime in the beginning years of World War II, rumors began to seep along the Kenai Peninsula that things were not right in Portlock. Men from the cannery town would go up into the hills to hunt the doll sheep and bear and never return. Worse yet, the stories ran, sometimes their mutilated bodies would be swept down into the lagoon, torn and dismembered in a way that bears could not or would not do. Tales were told of villagers tracking moose over soft ground they would find giant, man-like tracks over 18 inches in length closing upon those of the moose. The signs of a short struggle where the grass had been matted down, then only the deep tracks of the man-like animal departing toward the high, fog-shrouded mountains with their deep valleys and hidden glaciers. The newspaper story gives but a glimpse into the terror felt by the citizens of Portlock during this time. Finally, after numerous murders and unexplained disappearances, the town folk could stand no more. Enough was enough, and they all agreed it was time to go, and that is exactly what they did, all at the same time. The villagers packed up and walked away from Portlock, never to return. Even decades later, former residents refused to return to the former cannery town for fear of the Nantanuck, or Big Hairy Man. Former Portlock resident Melania Helen Keel was interviewed by Naomi Cloda, of the Homer Tribune back in October of 2009 and said things in Portlock started out well enough but degenerated to a point that the family left their home and fled to Nenwalik. The family had endured the murder of Melania's godfather, Andrew Kamluck, in 1931. Kamluck was a logger who was killed when someone or something hit him over the head with a piece of heavy log moving equipment. It was generally agreed that Kamluk was killed instantly and that the murderer would have had to have been a true brute to wield the piece of equipment in question as a lethal weapon. The family stuck it out in Portlock for more than a decade after the murder of Kamluk, but after being terrorized for a long period of time, along with all the other villagers, they finally picked up and left. 
We left our houses and the school and started all new here, said Keel. Tales of murder and mayhem rolled out of Portlock on a regular basis in the 1930s and 1940s, gaining steam during the World War II years. Port Graham elder Simeon Kaznikov told of the unexplained disappearance of a gold miner near the village during this time. He went up there one time and never came back, said Kaznikov. No one found any sign of him. Another interesting aspect of the Portlock story was relayed to Clouda by an Anchorage paramedic who preferred to remain anonymous. In 1990, while I was working as a paramedic in Anchorage, we got called out on an alarm for a man having a heart attack at the state jail in Eagle River. He was a native man in his 70s, and after I got him stabilized with IVs, O2, and cardiac drugs, my partner and I began to transport him to the native hospital in Anchorage. En route to the hospital, the paramedic and the native man, an Aleut from Port Graham, talked about hunting. The paramedic had been to Dogfish Bay and was once weathered in there. This old man sat up on the gurney and grabbed me by the front of my shirt. He got right up in my face and said, Did it bother you? Well, with that question, the hair just stood up on the back of my head. I said, Yes. Did you see it? was his next question. I said, No. Did you see it? He said, No, but my brother seen it. It chased him. Many dismiss the tales that have come out of Portlock due to the aggressive nature of the Sasquatch, for that is surely what the Nantanok is, if it is real at all, allegedly involved. While it is true most wood ape Sasquatch encounters end peacefully enough, that is not always the case. The Alaskan version of the species, if reports are to be believed, seems to be especially cantankerous, murderous even. In 1900, a group of hair-covered creatures ran at a prospector who had climbed a tree in an attempt to get his bearings near Thomas Bay. The prospectors said they were the most hideous creatures. I couldn't call them anything but devils. The prospector, upon seeing the creatures advancing on him, was able to drop down out of the tree, get to his canoe, and make his escape in the nick of time. He had no doubt in his mind that, had he not seen the creatures in time, they would have made short work of him. In 1920, one Albert Petka, who lived on his boat near Nolato, Alaska, was attacked by a bushman, another regional name for a Sasquatch-like creature. His dogs were able to eventually drive off the attacker, but the damage was done, and Petka's injuries proved fatal. He was able to tell the story of his attack before dying. In 1943, during the height of the siege of Portlock, a violent attack took place at DeWild's camp near Ruby, Alaska. The victim, John Meyer, some reports say McGuire, or the Dutchman, as he was called by the local Native Americans, was killed by an assailant thought to be the Bushman. He was badly beaten, but his dogs eventually were able to run the killer off. Meyer was able to get to his boat and travel to the nearest village to seek help, but unfortunately, he died of internal injuries shortly after arriving. He was, however, able to relate his story before passing. These are just a few of the reports of harrowing encounters with large, hair-covered bipeds that have come out of our northernmost state. There are more. The point here is that, to dismiss the story of Portlock out of hand due to the murderous behavior of the alleged Sasquatch involved would be a mistake. Tales of violent encounters and abductions attributed to wood apes have been told by Native Alaskans for hundreds of years. There is precedence for this sort of behavior by these animals in Alaska. You may not believe that an entire town could be terrorized by a rampaging wood ape to the point that the residents would abandon it. You may feel the strange story of Portlock, Alaska is, at best, greatly exaggerated and, at worst, completely fictional. What cannot be denied, however, is that Portlock was once a thriving community and that in 1949, residents left abruptly for no apparent reason. They left their houses, tanks, wharfs, pilings, and their livelihoods, and fled to nearby villages like English Bay and Port Graham. Also true is that residents of these two communities refuse to visit the ruins of Portlock to this very day. These two facts alone give the story the ring of truth. Something happened on the Kenai Peninsula back in the 1930s and 1940s. Something bad 